Amen. forgiveness of sins, healing, restoration, prosperity, all of those things when you stand still and expect and see the salvation of the Lord. So stop striving. Enter into God's rest. Kick back. Don't wrestle, just nestle. Up to Jesus. Amen. Woo, glory to God. The battle is ours. The battle is his, rather. The victory is ours. So we just nestle with you tonight, Father. We love you. The more I seek you, Thank you. 
this love is so deep It's more than I can stand I melt in your peace It's overwhelming The more we want to find you, God, in a secret place Take me back to where we started 
you, Father, that you're the reason for this season. We thank you, Jesus. We celebrate your birth, but Lord, we really celebrate all that you mean to us and all that you've done, all that you've accomplished when you went to Calvary's cross. Thank you, Lord, that you consummated a wonderful plan of redemption by shedding your blood for us. And Lord, now we don't need to live in darkness any longer, for you are the light of the world, and you've given us light revelation of who you are and the plan that you have for our lives. Thank you, Father. Glory be to God. Everybody say, for the Lord is good. Those of you watching tonight, we want you to know God loves you, cares about you. And this Christmas season is a great time to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Just reach out and say, Jesus, come into my heart and life. Be the Lord of my life. Direct my life. I submit to you today. No longer submitting to the world, the flesh, and the devil, but submitting to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm done with sin. I want to live for you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, he loves you very much. You can go ahead and be seated. Good to see you tonight. Hey, I encourage you. I wrote a letter to uh, President Biden, and I told him, you know, I think you're going to do much better if you get rid of some of this leftist uh, influence. You know, because right now, I said, with all due respect, sir, I said, you are headed for being the worst, I mean, one of the worst presidents in history. <laughs> I says, but that can change if you make Jesus the Lord of your life. And I let him put a track in there, too. Hopefully, he'll get it. And told him, make him Lord of your life, according to Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. And then forsake that leftist influence and become, I said, you campaigned on a, a, a of the platform of uh, being a centrist or a moderate. I said, get back to that and watch what will happen. Amen. So you can write a letter to the president too. What is that? Some, something, something, Pennsylvania Avenue? I forget what it is. But anyhow, look, look up his address and send it to him. I, huh? 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, the White House, President Biden, B-I-D-E-N, and send it to him and let him know your thoughts. Amen. Praise God. Well, something extra we want to do tonight, and that is we know that about 84 people have died in this, uh, these tornadoes that ripped through Kentucky and Tennessee, 84 people. So let's do something for the next two services. Here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to make an offering, and uh, you can go ahead and pass out the uh, envelopes if you would. And we'll, we'll make an offering. To, we'll take today, tonight's offering and Sunday's offering, put it together, and we'll send it to Operation Blessing and we'll earmark it to go to these uh, disaster victims in Kentucky and in Tennessee, people rebuilding. I heard one story, this is pretty cool, that a family was in their home and all this debris fell on them and they were trapped underneath there, but they had their cell phones. So they called the, the husband, whose name was Mark, and he would also he was at work in that candle factory and all this debris fell on him and he was trapped too. And so... They, they were able to communicate and somehow tell the, the authorities 
roughly where he was located, and they were able to dig him out and rescue him, and they got rescued, and so that was an ending to that, a good ending to that story. Got the Lord's help there. Amen? So uh, let's, let's do that tonight. We'll sow into, uh, and you can just put uh, OB on there. Uh, that stands for Operation Blessing, besides your amount that you want to sow into that. And we'll send that then after, we'll put this offering and Sunday's offering together and send it to them. How about that? Okay. So let's do that. And uh, whatever amount you want to sow to them, you can. Hey, and also, did everybody get some of these David DeMarco flyers? Because listen, this isn't just to put on your refrigerator this, and to remind you. This is to pass out to somebody that needs Jesus, somebody that's not saved, somebody that's in darkness. Maybe your relative, remember, Uncle Frank or... Uh, Uncle Aunt Sue, <laughs> whatever it is, but pass one of these out to them and tell them, get to this concert, okay? All right, a great opportunity, evangelistic concert. Amen. Anybody didn't get any, everybody get one of these? Is there anybody that didn't? Put your hand up if you didn't. All right. How many like two of them or three of them? Anybody? <laughs> okay. Bob's got them here. Let's go ahead and pray, brother, right now. Let's go. We'll pray. Thank you, Lord. Father, you are good, and your mercy endured forever, Father. And they are renewed every morning. Your mercy is renewed every morning. Father, we thank you, Lord God, as we bring our tithe and offering, Father. We come to lift it up to you as a memorial, Father God. We give with an open heart, Father, with a, a glad heart and an open hand. And we thank you, Lord God, for your blessings upon it, 30, 60, 100 fold, according to our faith. Everybody says, Amen. And don't forget, we're going to start the new year off with Pastor Matt and, and Scott Callender leading praise, and, and it's going to be a praise and prayer service. Pizza at 445, and then the service at 6 o'clock. We're going to have a great time. Start the new year with praise and prayer to our King. Glory to God. Let's praise Him. Yeah, make your check out to Word Alive Church, okay? And, and we'll and just put Operation Blessing beside it, but make it out to Word Alive Church, okay? And then we will add it all up. All right, let's praise him. God of miracles. Go ahead and praise him for it tonight. Glory to God. Good to see all of you tonight. Praise God. Got your Bibles tonight. Turn with me quickly, and I'm just going to 
preach a little bit, and then Pastor Matt's going to come up and really give you a message. In Psalm 27, verse 3, it says, Though an host, thank you, Father, for your word tonight in Jesus' name. Though an host should encamp against me. That means a whole bunch of people opposing you. My heart shall not fear. The only way to do that is if you ignore the circumstance, right? When you see a host encamped against you, but your heart's not going to fear, you say, no, I believe God's word is higher than the situation or the circumstance that's in front of me. I believe God is faithful, and I trust his word more than anything else that I can see, hear, smell, taste, or touch. And he goes on to say, I will not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. And then he goes down into verse 5. It says, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle he shall hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. By the way, I heard today that they made a comparison of this virus, this pandemic. They made a comparison to the 1918 Spanish flu. Do you remember that? And they said that people... Some people that had the Spanish flu back then had a lifetime full of immunities. But that's not my point. My point is this. They said the way it fizzled out or petered out was that there was a, a lower variant, a, a, less, a less dangerous strain that came along, and people got that, and that built an immunity into them, and finally the Spanish flu phased out completely. And they're saying that the same thing may be, it took two and a half years, by the way. That's how long the Spanish flu lasted, two and a half years. And then it phased out. And you see, today, we're two years into this pandemic, and guess what? We now have a less dangerous, milder Omicron variant out there. And could it be? And someone just posed this question, could it be that people are going to get this and then they'll have an immunity for the rest of their lives, they'll, they'll have an immunity against this and it will phase itself out. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Just like the 1918 Spanish flu. So, he says, fear not, no matter what you see. Amen? Hallelujah. It says in verse 11, teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path. Because of mine enemies. Well, what is that plain path? It's a path that's free from fears. God does not want you to fear. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Somebody said, well, I heard this today on the radio. Go to PA hypnosis, and you can be hypnotized, and it'll change your mental attitude, change your thinking. To that, I say, fooey, fooey, fooey. Three Chinese cheers. <laughs> because it's the, the word of God that will change your mental attitude. Ephesians 4.24 says, be renewed in the spirit of your minds. By what? By the word of God. Don't use some alternate approach. When God's told you, look, I'll change your mental attitude. If you just get in my word, get your mind renewed. What's it say in Romans 12, 2? Don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Away from fear and into faith. Hallelujah. I said away from fear into faith. So you don't have to visit PA hypnosis. No, that's a secular worldly way. No, I'm not going to submit myself to, to, to some hypnosis. I'm going to submit myself to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from me. Would you welcome Pastor Matt as he comes tonight? Come on, let's praise him for it. Glory. All right. Good evening, everybody. Good evening out there. If you're watching, well, thank you for joining us. So we are talking about overcoming fear, That's right. staying up, uh, not letting that oppression come on us. I know sometimes if you watch too much news, even, <laughs> even, even Christian news, right. it can tend to bring you down, make you start worrying about all the things you're talking about uh -huh. over in Europe. I guess yeah. they're doing a bunch of weird things with COVID, and you can't even like, go out of your house if you don't have the vaccine. And right. we're, we're believing that it won't happen in the U.S., Amen. and we need to pray for those that are in Europe that they can find some uh, freedom in that area, that's right. yeah. because that's a, an infringement on our freedom. So we want to talk tonight more about this, you know, how to live fear-free. 
You know, it's a constant thing. I could even be driving down the road, and, and this, just all the traffic can try to bring anxiety and, and anxious thoughts and f- a fret, you know, fretting. The other day, I was driving in the hustle and bustle of a city, and there was probably like eight lanes, and uh, I missed my turn, and therefore, I also entertained some anxiety because I didn't know where I was, and Google was recalculating, yeah. not quick enough. Right. <laughs> so, you know, I, I would have to say that I did operate in some fear, fear of wasting the rest of my day trying to find my way home, yeah. fear of uh, missing out on all the things that I wanted to do but couldn't do because I was in my car trying to find my way home. <laughs> my wife's patient with me. She, I think she drove, you took the wheel and took over or something, didn't you? Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, so that's what we need our spouses for to help us when we're not doing so well. But uh, the overcoming fear is, is a daily challenge in these, in these days that we live in. Not letting ourselves lose our peace or lose our joy. Not letting anxiety or, because we know what kingdom anxiety comes from, right? It's not from God. Being full of anxious thoughts and, ah, you know, that is not peace. That is not from God. Amen. And so we, we know that fear is from the kingdom of darkness. And uh, so that is not of God, but, but faith is of the kingdom of light. And so I want to talk about these, these things about, my dad mentioned it last Sunday, I think it was last Sunday, that, that fear is actually a spirit. Fear is actually a spirit that we have to, you know, sometimes you might be going along your day and you're like, I don't know why I'm so, like, I'm, a, I'm a kind of afraid to do, to do this. I'm afraid to do that. And why am I, like, having all these feelings? And there's really no other explanation for it, but a spirit is messing with you. And you say, but I'm a Christian. Well, we still live in a, a world full of darkness. And just like you go outside and you get dirty, even though you just got a bath and you're in your clean house, Things try to get on us. Yeah. And so we have to be aware of what is happening to us. Be aware. Why am I feeling anxious? Why am I, why am I afraid to do this? Or why, why do I not want to step out and be courageous in this moment? Yeah. And so it could be a spirit of fear. Right. And how do you deal with a spirit of fear? You have to rebuke it. it. Look at 2 Timothy. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love, and of a sound mind. So here again, it's not from God. Fear is not from God. It's not from his kingdom. His kingdom gives us what? Power. His kingdom gives us love. And his his kingdom gives us a sound mind. And all three of those things help us to live fear-free. It's amazing how that verse pretty much explains how to live fear-free. Let's talk more, before we get into that, let's talk more about getting rid of that spirit of fear. You know, the Bible says in Matthew, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. So you have some authority about what kind of things are messing with you. And if you know there's no rational reason for your thinking right now, you've never been afraid to do that before. Why are you afraid of it now all of a sudden? You know, go out of your house or shake someone's hand. Why are you all of a sudden afraid? Well, We need to recognize it as possibly irrational thinking because of a spirit messing with us. We need to bind it and say, I bind you, spirit of fear. Loose my family, loose my mind, and let me go in Jesus' name. And we have authority as believers in Jesus to bind every evil work that comes to our house to mess with us. Whether it's a spirit of infirmity Yep, Christians even have to deal with a spirit of infirmity, have to deal with a spirit of fear or a spirit of panic. I don't understand it all, but I do know that we are, we are free from it, but we have to exercise that freedom. And the third thing about getting rid of this spirit of fear is resisting. The Bible says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and what happens? He will flee from you. Submitting yourself to God enables you 
gives you the power because you're coming under his leadership, under his headship, to be the ruler of my life. Then you have the authority to resist because you're under his kingdom leadership, which gives you authority to say, in Jesus' name, I bind this, this evil force that's messing with my family or messing with my life. And you resist the devil and he has to flee. So these are all real things. I feel it on Halloween. I don't know if you do. On the high holy day of the kingdom of darkness, I feel a difference in the air. But guess what? As I exercise my authority, I'm free from any kingdom dominion from darkness. And so are you. But you just can't, can't sit there and go, huh, I feel like doing this to myself. Or I feel like you can't receive thoughts that are not from God's kingdom, entertain them, and expect to be free from the kingdom of darkness. So you have to exercise the authority and be aware of the schemes of the enemy. You know, there's that verse that says in Ephesians 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, the powers, and the rulers of the darkness of this world. So that pretty much tells you this. Sometimes we have to do some wrestling in the spirit. And sometimes it takes some intercession. Sometimes it takes some praying through. I learned in Bible school that sometimes you have to keep praying. Why do you have to keep praying? Because there's a war going on above your head. And there's a fight going on, and it's not over yet, and you got to keep praying. So we say praying through. That's how we call it. Remember that, Dave, in school? Yeah. Me and Dave went to the same school. It's called Rama. But they teach you how to pray through. You keep praying until you feel a release to be done praying and that you did your part and you, you fought the fight on your knees. Yeah. <clears throat> so let's go back to 2 Timothy and talk about the spirit of fear, but rather God's given us a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Think about those three things. Think about how those three things we need in this day that we live in. Amen. Power is the first thing. Let's talk about that for a second. The Bible says, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. There's a transference of power. Yes. You might not feel it as the person who's laying your hands on someone, but when you do it in faith, that other person could say, wow, my fever just left when you put your hands on me, and I felt something happened to me when you touched me. So what is that? That's the power. When you get la hands laid on you, two things happen. I believe when I've got my hands laid on me, two things happen. God puts deposits in me, and also things leave me. Yes. Things that I don't want, that aren't part of my kingdom of light, leave me. Maybe hang-ups, maybe uh, issues, maybe things that I've been struggling with, maybe th wrong thoughts about myself. Uh -huh. Those lies have to go when the power of God is manifested. Amen. And then deposits are made in me where... God will give me the courage to step out and believe and believe for something he wants me to do. Or he'll speak over me and say, no, I, I believe you can, you can lead people into worship. Or I believe you can step out and do this or that. Yeah. And deposits are made to fulfill your call. Yeah. And encounter, encountering the power of God will drive out anything that is not of God. So Ephesians 3.20 talks about that. With God's power working in us. God can do much more than anything we can ask or imagine. I like this verse. I was talking to my wife about this verse today. It's, it's really cool because when God's power is at work in us, we are actually operating on a higher level than natural. Isn't that great? So we can say things that are not even of ourselves. We could say things that are from, straight from heaven to a person. Straight divine utterance can come out of our mouth. Uh, vision from heaven. Vision to make decisions, visions to step out and do something, visions for even what to do of this day. That's right. It's amazing. Even if you're a cook, you, you can have divine direction on how to make a better, a better thing, a better meal. That's right. And I love the idea of living beyond my natural means and living supernatural. Yeah. Because it says right here, with God's power working in me, God in me can do much more than anything I can ask or imagine in my own self. Amen. Of course, I'm adding a few words here there, but that's pretty much what it's saying. Uh -huh. What I can even ask or imagine. 
Amen. So the second thing, that's power. The second thing is love. I can't tell you how whenever I experience God's love, it changes how I view myself, and then it changes how I function in society. So rather than being stressed out and fretting about going up to somebody and loving on them or sharing Jesus with them, because of God's love in me, that gives me confidence and courage, it's actually just flows out of you. Yeah, you might be a little nervous about rejection, which is it's, it's a human feeling. But, man, it's amazing that you have this special boldness that you didn't have because, of, because you know who you are in Christ. I'm going to ask my wife to come and share. Grab that. While she's coming, I want to say this. Walking in revelation of God's perfect love for you drives out fear because you learn to walk in your God-created value and authority. It drives out fear. You know that verse? Perfect love. Perfect love. Who's perfect? Who's perfect? God's love is perfect. And it actually just, when it comes into you, it drives out fear. How does that happen? Can you explain that to us? How do we experience God's love? Yeah, how does God's love drive away fear? Oh, my goodness. It's a wonderful thing. We all have access to the love of the Father. And um, one of my favorite practical ways of experiencing the love of God is at, is worship. Um, mm -hmm. When we, we enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. And so when we cultivate a lifestyle yeah. of worship with the Lord, he um, inhabits the praise of his people. Yeah. And when he does that, he shows us how much he loves us. That's right. And that will change your, perspe your perception of yourself. Yeah. So when, we're, when we are abiding with him and we have that lifestyle, we start to see ourselves the same way he sees us. And when we can do that, then we're, we're not afraid of anything. We, we have, he's got our back. He's, he's with us all the time. And Richard, you want to come up here for a second? I have, I have five boys. So um, whenever, Richard's one of the younger, one, younger brothers. He's, um, my oldest is 29, and then I have a 25-year-old. Um. I, I forget how old they are, but they all know. They're all really big men like Richard. <laughs> See this guy? He is huge. So imagine if I have four more. Well, William's small, but I'm not afraid of anything when he's with me. <laughs> I can go do anything because he's got my back. Amen. And right. anybody who messes with me messes with him. Right. Richard, what happens when somebody messes with your mama? Uh, you got five other people who will beat that person up. That's right. <laughs> that's right. And so thank you, Richard. So that's what it's like when we... Uh, we know that we're loved with, by the Father. He's got our back, and we do not have to be afraid of anything Amen. because we have the upper hand, and we win every battle mm -hmm. that we enter into. And uh, that perfect love is, is when we cultivate that relationship with the Lord and we remain in his love. That's and good. Like a, a perfect father will protect his child. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm talking like even if, a kid their age is, you know, kind of picking on him. He'll come up to the playground and say, hey, calm down, calm down. And he, he protects his child out of love. That's right. mm -hmm. And that's the same with our Heavenly Father. So that kid has no worries as long as his dad's there. That's right. That's right. And we have our Heavenly Father who's there with us all the time. And um, John 15, 9 through 10 says, I have loved you even as the Father has loved you. Love me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, mm -hmm. just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. And when we are in love with the Lord, um, to obey his commandments is an honor because we are so concerned about that relationship with him and that keeping an open vein of communication with him that we want to obey him. It's, it's our desire. So Matt is my husband. And I love him so much. I, I want to uh, keep that relationship open. So I work really hard to not offend him. So if he has a desire, I try to fulfill it because I want to keep that relationship mm -hmm. open. And so when we obey the Lord and we keep his commandments, we remain in his love. Yeah, that's and that's, that's so good. It's for our protection. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And I heard someone say one time, that verse is sort of backwards because when you experience his love, you'll want to obey his commands and you'll actually have the power to do it. So it's really hard to tell a, a young Christian or even an unsafe Christian, hey, you have to obey all these things and then you'll experience God's love. I like to tell them, experience God's love and he'll give you the power to obey the commandments. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that perfect love, it's so perfect like I said before, it changes how you see yourself. So rather than walking around with inferiority, I can't do this, I'm not good enough, uh, I mess up a lot, that whole, that whole uh, complex that the, that's from the devil's kingdom, that unworthiness. When you experience his love, you, you get this, not that you're better than anybody, but just this sense that I'm God's kid. That's right. <laughs> that's right. And I'm in his, I'm in his, his kingdom now. And I have access to his refrigerator, <laughs> or basically his supply. That's right. That's right. Whatever is in his kingdom, is, I have access to it. Right. It's my, he's my father. I can go into his house and grab a, grab a milkshake or, you know, something out of the fridge. And he would lovingly say, help yourself. That's right. Amen. Thank Amen. you. I'll call you back up in a minute. How about that? The third thing is sound mind. And this sound mind really occurs when you're renewing yourself in the Word. When your mind is transformed by the Word, we, we know that in Romans 12 too, right? Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. I encourage you, don't blend in with our culture. It says right here, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world. Don't try to be politically correct. Don't try to even be silent God, help us do it with love, but help us to speak the truth in love, but let God transform you. Everyone say, transform me. That's Romans 12, 2, into a new person by changing the way you think. You can throw that up there if you can find it. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So we see here, God gives you this transformation happens. God gives you a whole new mind, transforms you to think like him, to operate, to have thought patterns that are like heaven. I really don't think Adam went to bed worried about a lion coming and messing with him in the garden. I don't think he even thought about, you know, having to work extra hard, you know, because he didn't. Before, before he sinned, there was really, he just had to tend, tend the garden. He didn't have to work by the sweat of his brow. But that's the kind of kingdom reality he wants us to live in. He wants us not to strive. He wants us to, yes, fulfill his great commission, but do it in a way that does not cause us to lose our peace. So worry and anxiety can't stick around when you're, when you're transformed to think like God. So the question is, will you fulfill your call and God's purpose for your life by saying what God says, or will you be silent? I think I, sorry, I, I turned too many pages there. That's, that's later on, sorry. That's good too, though. I like that. So I don't want to partner with fear. I don't want to partner with the wrong kingdom. I only want to partner with thoughts of a disciplined mind, of a sound mind. And the word of God will push out wrong thoughts and wrong beliefs. Okay, so here's the, the next seven minutes. I want to give you the, the meat of my studies the last couple of days. And that is, how can I live with uncommon courage? Yeah. You know, it's easy just to live like everyone else, but how can you be that person that stands up for what is right and doesn't care what people think? Yeah. Lord, help us, right? Yeah. Help us to be a mouthpiece for God and not care what people think. Right. You know, not where we're offensive or we're 
purposely trying to just get in people's face and mess with them. But Lord, give us the grace to stand up and say what you're saying to our culture. So how can we live with uncommon courage? You know, when we look at the story of Joshua and Caleb, we, we know the story that they were part of the 12 spies that went into kind of spy out the land that God said was theirs. In Exodus 33, 1, we see right here that God gave this land to the uh, Israelites. It says, the Lord said to Moses, get going. You and the people you brought up from the land of Egypt, go up to the land I swore to give to you, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I told them, I will give this land to your descendants. So he's telling them, go, go get it. So here we know, Moses told everybody this, this land is ours. So Joshua and Caleb heard this, and they made this their final authority. And today, we need to make what God's saying over us and over our culture our final authority. Where do we find that? From the scriptures, from the word of God. So the Lord made a promise, and Joshua and Caleb stood on that promise and they were the only two out of the 12 that came back and kept saying what God said was theirs. And the other 10 kind of said what they saw and responded by the perplexity of the situation. So God, can we, in our situation in life right now, and we see everything that's going on, can we be the ones who keep saying what you said and not be moved by what we see? Numbers 13, 17, they gave Moses this account. We, want, we went into the land to which you sent us. This is where the 10 spies came back and gave their report. They said, it does flow with milk and honey. Here, it, here it's, it is its fruit. But the people who live there are so powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. And those are giants. And then 29, the Amalekites live in there. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. So they're pretty much, there's, the enemy is everywhere. And I don't think we can take them is what they're saying. And then down there in 33, verse 33, it says, We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. So they're pretty much telling Moses and everyone this is a long shot. I know God said we could have this, but I don't see how it's going to happen. But Caleb reported this in verse 30 of chapter 13. So Numbers 13, 30. He said, then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. So God, give us that kind of courage. When everyone else is saying one thing, in a group, or in our neighborhood, or in our county, or in our state. We're all moving this way. Why aren't you moving this way with us? Because that's not what God is saying. We're going to say what God is saying. He, and he's saying, in this story, he's saying, take the promised land because I'm giving it to you. So he was counterculture. He was the counterculture. He was going against the culture. Caleb spoke something different. In Numbers 14, 8, it says, The Lord is pleased with us. He will lead us into, this is Caleb speaking some more. He will lead us into that land and give us that fertile land. Don't turn against the Lord. Don't be afraid of the people in the land. We, get this, we will chew them up. Yeah. That's in the New Century Version. They have no protection, but the Lord is with us, so don't be afraid of them. Wow. We should walk into Walmart the next time it's empty shelves and say, I will have plenty to eat <laughs> because my God says he'll supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. When there's a ships all on the coast waiting to bring their supplies in. I have more than enough should come out of our mouth. Not, oh, no, Amen. we're all going to starve. We should say what God's saying, right? Amen to that. Not what our circumstances are saying. 
We must believe God can do what he says he can do. I want to be like that Caleb guy who said what God said. Even though he, he, he saw the same things the other 10 people saw, but he said something different. Lord, help us to be the ones to say what you're saying. Caleb was speaking from a posture of faith and trust. He didn't have to think about it. It was already in him. You know, being courageous is not a button you push. It actually becomes part of you because of what's inside of you. You grow your faith. You grow your trust in the Lord. You grow in your ability to walk in your God-given authority. And courage just flows out of you. I don't think Caleb took a class on how to be courageous. I don't think Joshua took a class on how to be courageous. It was part of them because they became who God created them to be. So Caleb took some negative advice. He took some negative feedback in Numbers 14, 2 through 4. Their voices rose in a great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. And they even actually, if you look down, they talked about trying to stone Joshua and Caleb. Yes, they did. And notice what happens in 14.10. But the whole community began to talk about stoning Joshua and Caleb. This is 14, verse 10. Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to all the Israelites at the tabernacle. Now, his message wasn't very like, hey, good job, guys. He was actually upset with the doubters and the complainers and the murmurers. I mean, he wanted to bring them into this promised land, but he wanted to bring in a generation of faith-filled Israelites, his people. And they saw all these miracles coming out of Egyptian bondage, going across the Red Sea, all the ten plagues. they seen all these miracles, but they, they still kept complaining. I'm thirsty. We should have just stayed back where we were. And he just wanted, God just wanted to have people of faith to bring into that promised land. So help us, God. So this glorious presence came to the aid of Joshua and Caleb. I love that. It stopped right there any stone from being thrown. So I, I'm saying this tonight to you and to you out there. When you stand up and you speak the truth and you get some negative feedback, even maybe if somebody wants to throw something at you, believe that God will protect you. Amen. Believe that he will get your back. Amen. Just like Richard here was, had his mom's back. Amen. Believe that God will get, take, take care of you. Yes. That's the best place to be. The best place is for him to be behind us going, just try something. Go ahead. That's, that's, my, that's my faith-filled servant. He's not afraid. That's right. He sees himself the way I created him to be, and he's going to say what I'm telling him to say. Come on, so I know it's 8 o'clock, but I want to share one more thing if I can. You guys okay with that? Yes. So we talk about Joshua and Caleb, but let's look at this last verse in Exodus 33:7. The best, the best way I know, one of the best ways I know to, to overcome, to be courageous, is to spend time in God's presence. Amen. And we see it right here. I was reading this today, and it just went off of me. It was Moses' practice to take the tent of meeting, this is basically like a prayer closet, and set it up some distance from the camp. Everyone who wanted to make a request of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. Whenever Moses went to the tent of meeting, all the people would get up and stand at the, in the entrance of their own tents. So this is a big deal. So Moses went into this special prayer closet. Everyone got outside of their tents. They watched this cloud come down to the, his tent. Yes. And they all started worshiping the Lord. And the presence of God filled that tent yes. and hung out with Moses. Let's read about it. They all watched Moses until he, the, he disappeared Inside this tent. He went inside the tent. The pillar cloud would come down and hover at its entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Verse 10. When the people saw the cloud standing at the entrance, they would bow down and worship. Verse 11. Inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face. As one speaks to a friend. He wasn't giving him orders. 
He wasn't being bossy. He was treating him like a father, a loving father, like a friend. And afterwards, this is the part I really like. Afterwards, Moses would return to the camp. He left this tent, but something very interesting happened. The young man who assisted Moses, his name was Joshua, son of Nun, would remain behind in the tent of meeting. What just happened? Joshua was just his sidekick, helping him probably carry his stuff. But he was so taken and so transformed by the presence of God that he stuck around that presence till every last drop of that was gone and was transformed to think and act and behave and talk and live and was transformed by the power to, to behave like a courageous soldier. So how do we become courageous? Spending time in God's prayer closet, in our prayer closet, talking to God, spending time with him. Is it something that we have to do? No. But it's an amazing thing that we can do. We get to. And he loves, he loves to hang out with us. He's not too busy. He loves to spend time with us just like a friend would spend time with you. He actually likes you. He actually wants to commune with you. He's waiting for a discussion. He's waiting to talk with you. Anything else you want to say real quick? We got like two minutes. Sorry, we have a lot to say. Sorry. I know this is this is one of my favorite topics because it's some practical, something we all all as Christians get to do. Yep. Um, so I know Joshua one eight through nine kind of sums up. Yeah, that's a good the one. The message here, if I can get my phone working, it says. Keep this book of laws always on your lips. Meditate mm -hmm. on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you mm -hmm. will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So as we keep our ma as we get into the Lord's word and we meditate it and we keep it constantly flowing through our lips, he will be with us. Yeah. We don't have to be afraid. We can be strong and courageous, and, and he'll go with us wherever we go. And the promised land that, um, is, that the Israelites were given, we have a promise also in our own lives, a destiny, a calling that yeah. God created us to, to do. Amen. So uh, we all have that promised land that God's calling us to. So good. That verse summarizes my whole message. You get into the word. You meditate on it day and night. It transforms how you see yourself, how you operate, your original design like Adam. When you start to act like that, you'll be courageous and fear will be gone because you'll walk in divine love. So good. So thanks for sharing that. Let's stand as we pray tonight. I encourage you to see yourself as just like Joshua and Caleb. As you get into that tent of meeting, as you get into the word, as it transforms your thinking, you can operate just like them and say what God is saying when everyone else is saying something different. Amen. When I say everyone else, I mean everyone in the world That's right. is saying something different. Yeah. I really believe the church is going to get stronger even when the world gets darker. That's right. yeah. That means you individually. Yeah. That means even financially. Uh -huh. Because how can the church get stronger... If we're all broke. <laughs> so I believe the, the wealth of the sinner is laid up for these just, these just people in churches. And God is going to continue to find favor and bless you because you're part of the last day remnant. So let's pray. God, we thank you that you are for us, that you want us to live courageously in these last days, that you want us to not back down, not be quiet, not... Not step behind and be invisible, but you want us to be your mouthpiece. You want us to be your ambassadors and love people and bring them the message of hope. You want us to not just walk by and smile, but God, you want us to be your mouthpiece. So Lord, give us the grace to do it. Give us the, the hunger 
to do what our Father would have us to do. And Jesus, we just thank you for the courage to do it, a hunger to bring people out of darkness and into your marvelous light, to give them a glimpse of your love and your forgiveness and your, and your, and your hope, and there's never a lost case with you, God. So, Lord, give us that same mind as you have, a compassionate heart to care for the, the unlovely and the broken and the hurting, Lord. Help us to be and see and feel what you feel for these people, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you.